really the issues are up for grabs. Like, I don't think it's a very well worded essay, to be honest. Hello. Agree. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Hi, I just wanted to make sure Shawnee's mic was working and you can hear us. Yes, thank you. Okay, you guys have a great class. Thanks. And you can hear us? Yes, we can hear you clear. Hi, Shawnee. Thank you. Hi, Shawnee. By the way, 33 degrees is over, is over 93 Fahrenheit. Damn. <laughs> just, an average, just an average summer day here. <laughs> You're melting. Um, ice water, ice water, and a and a flat white. You know, I need both. Yeah, good. <laughs> no one knows what a flat white is here, Bonnie. Um, although I they, know what a know. flat white is. I used to live in Australia. Okay, there you go. I love a flat white. <laughs> We're all a bit jealous. The, and the okay. coffee in Melbourne is very good. So what is okay? What is metonym? What is the, what is metonym? What is a flat white? <laughs> okay, let's coffee. Coffee. coffee coffee that's it yes what is it just, it's, it's milk it's uh, yeah okay thanks it's like a latte but with more coffee okay sorry peter <laughs> that's okay these are important things what is metonym what is metonym what are we talking about here it is what it is it is what it is. That's pretty you want good. A definition? I looked it up. Okay. It says um, a word name expressed, a word or name expressed used as a substitute for something else with which it is closely associated. A substitute. That's a good one. But I read a thing that actually was kind of interesting it was it said like um it's a closely associated word that can be used as a symbol for what it is so like um yeah. a suit is a word for a corporate guy you call him a suit mm -hmm. or um there was another another one too but it's something that you identify not in a big abstract way but just very um <clears throat> very closely closely related to the actual thing and then yeah. use that as a stand-in. I kept getting it confused yeah. with a Schenectady. <laughs> with what, sorry? I, I said I kept getting it confused with the Schenectady, which is um, uh, where, where you use a part of something to represent the whole thing. Um, okay. And I, it, I think it's, it's kind of similar, but it's like there's a substantial difference between the two, I think. What's metaphor then? How 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 is metaphor different? Well, metaphor is the whole story, not just a word. Me metaphor, I think, abstracts it to to a bigger level. So that's it's this like equivalent relationship, but it's in a completely different um, realm. So like a suit and a corporate guy, but then it's, but a, a metaphor would be like taking it to a more abstracted level, like a, what would be like a, um, a suit is to a corporate guy as a, something is to something else. It's, so it looks at a bigger relational um, meaning, I think. Maybe like yeah. like comparing sharks to businessmen or something. Um, yeah. Oh. Well. Some people think that a metaphor is a general name for all these other types of relationships, like a, a simile, for instance. The, the, the dog is like a, I don't know, like a tiger. Or something. Um, the that that's just a type of metaphor. And a, and a suit is a type of metaphor. Or a connection. Maybe it has less significance. For the whole. Like to say, sales instead of three boats. But those are all types of metaphors, which are just 
anything standing for something else. Yeah, my, my understanding is metaphor. Um, there's a there's a sh there's shared characteristics. So, for example, if 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 we were to say that guy is bullish, yeah, so that 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 would be a metaphor because the 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 shared characteristics between the character the character of the person we're talking about and the bull. Whereas metonym, it's there's no shared characteristics. It's replace. It's taking something that's not that the, the characteristics aren't shared and replacing one with the other. I so the, the thought that came to my mind was calling a New Zealander a Kiwi. <laughs> yeah, it's not a metaphor. It's a metonym. It's a metonym. This is true. So there's no shared characteristics. It's just one's replacing the other. Is that a bird or a fruit? Is it, I mean, is it a New Zealander? It's a, bird, it's a it's a ground walking bird that can't fly. But it has it has shared characteristics with the fruit because they're both fuzzy and small and brown. <laughs> oh, and, green, and green on the inside. <laughs> and green on the inside. Actually, the golden ones are much better. <laughs> I don't know if you can get those. And so, and golden. so, like as. So what I thought we'd do is just start off with things that are not metonyms. Can so, I can I correct myself? I think I talked about a metaphor, but I meant an analogy. I, I used the wrong word. Well, it, they have shared characteristics. And and it's it's not a hundred percent correct that we get uh, you know that we arrive at a definition that's sort of correct or something. But it's just a way to get into this conversation a little bit because the author uses it. Um, Anita, I'm going to mute you just to see if it's if there's an echo right. from you. Is that better? Yeah, that's better. So feel free to unmute yourself if you want to say something in here. It's just while we're, the other people are talking so we don't get that echo. Um, so I thought we'd start off with some paintings by other people you know. And I'm, I'm not going to tell you who they're by because I want you to yell out who they're by. So who's the first one? Pollock. Pollock. Yeah. And you probably know it's it's Pollock number 31, Pollock number 131 at the MoMA. What about this one? Newman. Barnett Newman. Barnett Newman, exactly. Barnett Newman. A great big expanse of a painting. <clears throat> Hi, Leslie. Hi. Clifford um, Steele. Yeah, Clifford Steele. Clifford Still. Yep, good guess. Fine. That's a mess of wind. Motherwell. Motherwell, yeah. Motherwell, yeah. Mother yeah. Um, Franco's Balls, remember? Eulogy for the Spanish Republic. Mm -hmm. Which he did 280 times, 240 times, exactly the same image. Um, Coonings. Coonings. Coonings, woman, woman one, with the silver stripe down the right side from the MoMA. Now, this will be a little interesting if you know this one. Who's this? It's starts with an L, um, industrial. Uh, starts with an L, maybe. Ledger or ledger or something like that. No, I don't think it's, it's ledger. Um, right now. Richard Pusadar. Oh, wow. Oh. Oh. Pusadar. 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 So these Pusadar. are all. Yeah. Richard Pusadar is the most. Uh, metonymical, if that's the word, um, of all of those bunch. But all the previous ones, the reason we can identify them so simply is because these artists each came up with their sort of thing that they do. So when Rothko worked out what he did, he just did it over and over and over again. And same with Clifford Still, same with Motherwell, same with Barnett Newman, same with Pollock. 
de Kooning got a little bit less sort of stayed in his ways, like he sort of shifted and changed, but the way he was doing it didn't change. Pusat Dart maybe is the most interesting in a way because he began to let other things in. Now this is Lee Krasner. Yeah. That's what we do. I tried to pull the works that were got mentioned in the essay. And I think I've got five of each to look at that we can sort of talk about to keep it even. So five Krasners, five Mitchells, and five Frankenthalers. Um, the, the first one's called The Eye is the First Circle. And so the, um, the thing that what I'm getting from the essay is that, well, the, the, the thing has to be posited by Robert Hobbes and, you know, not very well put together. And, so, and I actually don't even think he makes his point at all. Like, I think he sort of has this idea and he just waffles around and doesn't even sort of really make the point clear. But um, the, the, the point that I think he's getting at is that the metonym idea, which is that it is different to metaphor. So basically metaphor um, is the, these guys made these paintings, they came up with something that, um, stat, that, that becomes known as them and they do it over and over again and they don't really depart from what they're doing. So there's no real search or quest. It's more a performance. So it's very theatrical. And so all those associations that, that we read about, about the expressions, the, the theatricality, the performance aspect, the heroic aspect, you know, they, they paint a great big painting and they pulled off another one heroically. All of that sort of suit the idea of metaphor. Whereas the metonym idea, I think, doesn't. There's still that echo there somewhere. Not me, Peter. This time, I think a lot of people are muted. You just have to mute everyone, and people can just unmute themselves if they want to speak. How's that? That's it. Meta, um, echo gone. Um, yeah, the point I think he's making is that there's a whole different way of working that Krasner, Mitchell, and Frankenthaler may not have invented, but certainly did practice and may be the sort of the first artist to really um, make it central to their way of working. And the reason I, I'm finding it so interesting is because I'm over the 20 years I've been in New York, I'm, I'm getting a lot of just, I'm, I'm finding myself in a lot of discussions with other artists and they're saying these, the things that I think Frankenthaler and, and Mitchell and Krasner would have said, not what Pollock and de Kooning and those artists were saying. And so I sort of feel like something began in the fifties and, and there are artists, I think, before who were touching upon it, but something certainly began in the 50s with these artists that's been, that's been sustained. And it's in the female Aboriginal artists that, I, that I've also um, become quite passionate about. And part, partly it's the method of working is um, no longer this thing that the artist does uh, and, and it's no longer performative in that way and no, lo no longer theatrical in that way. It's much more contemplative and much more interactive. It's much slower, it's much, it's, um, and, and this, this process that these artists engaged in, what I'm getting from this essay and certainly what I'm getting from the works themselves, um, the, the um, things that they're letting in, like the connections with nature are being led in in, a, in an intuitive way. They're being sort of sensed. And those <clears throat> intuitive um, connections that they're establishing as they're working, then prescribe and direct the course that the painting will take, that they'll take with the painting. And that's a very different way of working than I'm, I've got to go and do my Jackson Pollock painting and I'm and I'm going to 
you know, resolve whatever problems occur for this particular pain, but basically I know what I'm doing. So there's no sort of, it, it's not going to be a, I'm not, you know, Pollock's not going to suddenly make a Rothko painting, for example. So the, um, and the, the, not only are the, are the, there's sort of things from the real world that are being intuited and being sensed as the relationships form, but they're held in abeyance. So there's like, and this is the one point that he did make that they're, they're, held in abeyance and allowed to remain mysterious <clears throat> and so they're not sort of allowing the painting to become literal or spell out something and so there's a there's again what i'm i'm sensing is there's the there's a there's a big leap almost into the painting that the artist is taking it's almost like the connection that's being formed with the painting is more like a relationship where you where you start to feel empathetic with a person start to relate to the person in a deep way and almost start to lose yourself in that relationship. So, you know, that's where I'm sort of taking the term metonym. Now, I don't know if you agree with this, but I'm sort of feeling it's more like the act of painting and the, and the, these, these, um, the process was becoming much more important as a, as a means by which the artist could connect to the, to what was evolving not remaining separate from from the artist does that make any sense at all <laughs> yes it does actually um and and uh, the reason why i'm sort of a little bit into into this is because it's it's something that i'm finding myself in conversations all the time with people about this about you know, artists are talking about what they're seeing evolving in the paint and the paint relationships. Um, I think it makes sense, but it doesn't seem to me to have anything to do with metonym or meta metaphor. It's just, but I think it's right what you're saying about the painters. Yeah. I don't this see is... why that makes it a meta name or, or but anyway. Uh, this is just oh. me, probably, but I do appreciate these abstract expressionist women's paintings. I like them, but probably I may feel like Jackson Pollock or De Kooning more artistically consistent, and I feel more power from these male. Probably they might they were except like John Mitchell. I don't. I feel like female painters, I mean, it, this, especially the sailor, um, a little bit. So, yeah, I feel like, uh, yeah, I, yeah, that's what the only thing I, I want to say. Yeah. yeah, I think it's interesting because you, you use the word consistent and that, that's, that's, that's the point, right? Uh, they are consistent, they're making the, Pollock is making a Pollock and, and the Kooning is making a the Kooning, right? Whereas right. the other ones, the women have a different approach. And that's actually very, I mean, this tells us a lot about position of women and men in the society and all that, of course. And 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 maybe maybe it, it even has to do with the with the market, right? That the men tend to make a product. I don't think they are. It's a it's a product, and there, 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 there's a there's a there's a crowd that, that is expecting something from this artist, and that's what they produce. And the women are, in a way, more free. I mean, they, they have other issues, but they're more free to, you know, do their thing. That's that's what it suggests to me when I listen to you. And yeah, um, you don't agree with that, Judy. No, I don't, because I think people like de Kooning and Pollock and Rothko and Motherwell, they all did exactly the same thing to get to what's being called a product. And the fact that they did it mm -hmm. more than once, I don't think is a criticism. I think it's that they were learning how to do it better and in different ways they were using intellectual ideas, but using like symbolism to create it. I, I think that men and women were different in the in the 50s and 60s and, and men had more of a um, a hold on the art world, but I don't think their processes were that different. You don't think so? No. 
Yeah. I think there's something about in the article that was saying too, like what the metaphor actually is, and that the that the the men, I'll just say the men were 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 kind of thought their works were representing some higher ideal um, and that that was the removal, that was the historical removal and that the women yeah. were kind of, you know, like the one that the you're one showing that right now, there's her name in it, there's the plant in her room in it. And by using things that were very tangible and, um, you know, within grasp and within experience, rather than going for some lofty ideal, um, that's that was I. That's what I took as the distinction, actually. But in the, do you, do you think that there's less significance based on what you're saying? I don't go there. No, I don't. I, when I it's, it's science, it's science. Yeah. If you look at the opposite of mitosis and meiosis. Both are, are cell divisions, but one, mm. one uh, the meiosis has fewer chromosomes and therefore less significant. And so that's an interesting comparison. I mean, this is what struck, I have a science background, so it struck me. Um, maybe metaphor is um, more profound. I don't know. No, it's not. Uh, yeah, I, I can't think. say that one's more significant over the other. Although, well, I, but I do asking. think, I do think that the um, something began that has been continued on, and, and and it began with the women artists more than the men. Just oh, just because I, I hear this okay. conversation all the time, I hear the the uh, like when I'm talking to artists, my peers, or um, you know, or, or, you know, the many people I've talked to often there's a reference to what's being felt is evolving in the in the color relationships and the relationships that that are forming on the painting and that that's relevant now pollock never talked that way mm. okay he, he executed he was a he solved the problem he heroically you know completed another performance so it was yeah, more the, doers. the heroism and the and the resolution to the problem so for example even this painting by de Kooning, my, you know, one of my teachers, Charles Kajori, who knew de Kooning, often talked about this silver mark down the corner, down the, the right edge. You know, what a great solution, what a blah, 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 blah to the problem, you know? So it was, it was a whole different way of thinking than this way of thinking, which isn't really about finding a solution and isn't, um, it's more, it's more about what's being, what is what's evolving as the paint relationships are forming and connecting to that and continuing with that. And that's what I'm sensing is a whole different thing. And that thing that's evolving is sort of, you know, I thought it might be fun to start looking at a few other not tonight, but basically over the next few weeks, just to sort of try to get a, uh, a sense of what the, the consequences of this way of thinking are because I think what's evolving is more than just and this is where I think he does get a bit like I didn't you know he he his idea that this painting began listen began with the name and there's breasts there and you know plants and stuff to me that's too literal and actually metaphoric not not actually what his argument's all about um, but I thought it I thought what's really evolving is actually something <laughs> different it's to do with light it's to do with nature it's to do with letting stuff in of the real world and so like your point before Lorraine about you know your your take on the idea of metam as being these artists um, referred to or found things that were very close or in their intimate world in their own space Stephen um, that makes it real in a, and and you know you got to think about the you know um, paintings by like Mirandi or um, Bonnard who are painting just, their, just their, the, the environment that they're in, the room that they're in and making great works that are very significant. So I don't find it, it, it's not relevant if the, if the titles 
the Heraclius Subliminus or something very high minded, um, as in Newman's case, or in, in Motherwell's, if he's taking on this, you know, a, a painting that's in protest about Franco or, you know, taking on revolutionary causes or something. Um, I think it's actually what's what's going on is something much more significant. But doesn't this piece look derivative of de Kooning? Does it look derivative of de Kooning is Leah's question. What do we think? Necessarily. What's that? Not necessarily. I, I, Not I necessarily, no. It's, you know, it's very different in a way. Like, yes, there's similarities, Leah, because there's the line going around, and then there's the articulation with the color of the of the forms that are that are evo that are being um, that are evolving. And the interesting thing is almost the way that she's done that, like the way that she's touched the forms within the shape to make that come alive. So to make that volume come alive, you know, I don't know if that's a face or not. Like I, like I, I sort of, you know, if I start thinking that way, you know, if that becomes a face and that becomes an arm and all that, then it starts to get a little bit simplistic for me. But I think what's being, what's being evoked in this painting is a little bit more interesting than that when I consider the touch and certainly in this painting, you know, this is the, this is um, earlier. <clears throat> and this one was about the same time, 57 as this other one. This is Sun Woman one and Sun Woman two. Well, you know, again, her, her, her differences in touch and what she's leaving and what she's not leaving and the way things are working together seem to evoke something from the real world. They're not just purely abstract anymore, even though it is ab obviously abstract. The feeling is so different from the cooling. Yeah. It doesn't feel angry, does it? Not fierce, no. The gunning is violent. It's the really violent. violent. It's violent. Violent and drunken. So this doesn't feel violent, right? Oh. Now you know, Krasner's drawing definitely links it to the Kuni because she's drawing through space. So you can see these marks go back into space, mm. and then she's moving the forms in space. So. Each time she's articulating even this, she's giving us the sense that this is some cylindrical form that's flower-like or leaf-like, but it's cylindrical form that's moving back into space. It doesn't sit flat. And this is sitting spatially in relation to it. And as I look around, like this, this comes out of space, this goes back and this comes out. So each, each part of the painting as I look around, it seems to be doing moving some way in space in how relation you, to each other. How would you compare this painting to the paintings de Kooning did at the end of his life, just before he died? We'd have to have a look. That'd be interesting. I think I think they have a similarity. You do? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we'll 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 do that one night, Judy. Okay. The ones where his assistants were painting him or the ones that he actually painted? Well, I hope, I don't know. I mean, it, they, were before, in, they, they of, were in the last de Kooning show at MoMA. Yeah, before um, maybe 81. It was, I mean, he was getting Alzheimer's, I know, but yeah. um, I think he was still working. I think that part of his brain was still, in, still enabled him to do some work. So yeah. I, don't, I don't know specifically about, you know, which was which, Yeah, what you're saying. Yeah, in my other class, I have a one 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 of the students was um, and the assistant for de Kooning. Oh and yeah, she, I have a friend who was an assistant. Yeah. And she talked about that period, and she said, "Well, you know, 
he was making the paintings when I was there, but then when I left, some other people came in and they started getting well, a bit more involved. So, yeah. but she was careful not to really say too much, but yeah, this is called The Seasons. Peter, I think these are more soothing or it, the limited color has something to do with it to me. Yeah. Right? So the, the, they're more colorful, definitely, right? Yeah, but the color is limited, right? Which helps me as a viewer to get around these forms. There's not so much color that I get confused or maybe, I don't know. Yeah. There's something about that to me. Yeah. For me, they evoke like, uh, like Matisse. I think they have more of a decorative arts sort of look to them, like like an interior design sort of, um, you know, porcelain paintings and things like that. In terms of the way they resolve? Just... Because it gets pretty awkward, this color, some of the color ideas she's getting here. I, I think in the color, I think in the color choices and the and the delicate sort of delicate application. I think that they're cheerful. There's like an explosion of like happy energy coming out of it. And maybe it is the color choice. Maybe it is the, you know, kind of randomness and, and not very specific nature of the paint. Yeah, the and they're very, these are later ones, right? So um this is 57 and this is 51 no it's not this is 1960 what am i saying um and the um around that time the moma had monet's late um water lily painting hanging and so these artists would have seen that and there's a bunch of other paintings and it'll be fun to sort of go and look at what they were actually looking at at the time, what Krasner, Frankenthaler and Mitchell were looking at at the time and how they were influenced or if they were influenced. Um, the, um, and certainly what Monet did in that painting, I don't know if you've sat in front of that painting for a while, but the, um, that Monet, um, is sort of made with lots of little marks. And so by using lots of little marks, it sort of becomes easier to start to see how those marks relate. If you think of Franz Klein, like someone mentioned Franz Klein before, but even the ones we just looked at, because of the, because of the size of the marks that are being used, they're not, the artists aren't really able to sort of see how they're relating other than just, uh, just in, in terms of the the whole and where they're going, but not not the subtleties. They're not able to sort of take little incremental steps in building up relationships. And you know that's also what I think. You know, you know these like this is a Joan Mitchell I'm putting up now. Um, we're able to do is to actually start building up their images with lots of little marks, and to be observing how these marks are relating as they were being built up. So the scale of the marks sort of, I think, changed. Now in the Krasna, she's touching it all the way across. So you can sort of see her paying attention to sort of how this form is evolving, sort of roughly even. Which, you know, even though the color I think is nice, like, like I think it avoids decoration just because of the tactility of the painting. Just in the, in the act of making it, it sort of feels so, um, I don't know what the right word is, but I was gonna say mothered into existence, but that's not the right word. Doesn't that remind you of um, Picasso and like Brancusi where they have these anthrop uh, more sort of round shapes? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Right? Like 
the nose. Yeah. Like Picasso's drawings of nose, you know, paintings of the, and the women with the big noses and, you know. Yeah, he sort of idealized all the, all the bodies and yeah. made sort of classical Greek. Yeah. And, and I, know, I also yeah. noticed that she, her compression of the space is, is more expansive. So uh, more relaxed, as you said earlier, you know, from before. Yeah. Not as tight and it's more, you know, Southern, I guess, Mediterranean. Oh, I thought you meant Southern US. No. It's Southern Mediterranean. I thought, well, this is interesting. <laughs> um, so this is Joan Mitchell. This is George right. went, sorry, yeah. Can I say something just about the Krasner? Um, Cause we've been talking about male, female and suddenly I, I was thinking that this one and the one before it, I've never thought of it this way but they almost look like table settings. Mm. Um, and somebody also mentioned like something more domestic and pottery, like there is a quality of sort of breaking through or, or deconstructing before deconstruction was a word, I guess. But um, the, especially the one before it suddenly just, it looked like a table, like a place setting mm -hmm. and- um, And a tablecloth almost. Yeah, and fabric. But that, like you said, Peter, that the, the lines break the space up and kind of, it, that's not all it is. It's also, you know, it's also any, any number of things, but- um, like if you look at this one and you look at the next one, would you have thought a man, if you didn't know who did it, would you think it was done by a woman or a man? And there's something, now I'm seeing a, like a kind of domestic ref, reference in it, in a way, it's a, a, in addition to all the, you know, physical yeah. and yeah. yeah figurative stuff. Anyway, I just never really saw that. That's before. a really good thought. But that's a really good point, no matter what year it is, because women are going to do things from who they are, and men are going to do things from who they are. I don't know. If you talk to my Gen Z son, he would say, no, let's not talk about gender. It's fluid. Stop. <laughs> so, I, guess, I guess that's pretty antiquated, what I'm saying. Well, yeah, I think, I, I, you know, I, I agree with that in terms of the the way things are now, that the conversation can't be about the generalization, but to not, you know, the, the whole point of what this, this essay is doing is actually looking at these artists and saying, you know, something happened that these artists did that's really important. And so it's, it's you know, as to why they did it, it's, you know, I don't know if it's because of the gender or not. I don't know if we can make that leap, but but the um the, there is something, and it could be to do with Monet and the, and the the attention that Monet was giving, the looking that he was doing at nature, um, in terms of making his metaphors, and if, and and that certainly that late um, painting that the MoMA has that great big mural sized painting where the where the the, it, it it departs from purely being a, a metaphor of something outside the painting and something else happens in terms of the structure and the relationships that form. And the understanding I'm getting is that it was the these, you know, probably many, many arts at the time. There's the echo there again, I think. Katri, if you can just mute everyone for me, thanks. Thank you. The, um, yeah, the, is the, sorry, the, um, where Monet was sort of looking at, na or, well, the impressionists really, where they were looking at nature incredibly closely these artists in New York started looking at their 
the paint on the surface of the canvas incredibly closely. So there's sort of a, a taking from one to the other. So I don't necessarily think it was, but I do think it was it was different than say these artists up here, because whilst they were looking at the paint carefully, like every nuance is, is owned, they're not allowing the evolution of those relationships to distract them or vary them from their path to their end result, which is this. It's always going to, Rothko is always going to end up making a Rothko. And it's that, that observation of what's evolving that then, you know, to get to Tomiko's point, you know, that led the, uh, le le left the, what le left the um, result to be uncertain. So that these artists over their careers didn't just produce the same 240 paintings, but they evolve rapidly over time. So these, you know, the, even the ones that we're looking at Krasno, which are all done within a six year period are, are incredibly different. Um, and I think that's what, where they get interesting to me anyway. You know, I have a question about that. You know, you always talk about, or, or you hear the galleries, like they say, if you want to get into a gallery and you get in and you paint sparrows, they're always going to want sparrows from you. Do you think the fact that um, the men were more likely um, going to get gallery representation and so they produce the same thing because of, you know, maybe it was a product and um, whereas the women were not as likely to get gallery representation and so therefore they had more freedom and didn't necessarily have to stick with all sparrows, so to speak. I think, well, from what I understand from all the, all the discussions I've had is, the, is that everyone in the downtown scene despised the uptown scene. Um, so they, they really hated the, the idea of these uptown galleries with all these snooty people. And they were downtown and the, and the uptown people didn't really want to travel downtown. They thought it was dangerous to go below Union Square, basically. And so they, you know, they, they wouldn't go down there. So there was a, there was no, you know, when, and when the artists started showing in the galleries, like um, the, these, these bunch that we've got here and, and some more as well, then everyone started fighting. There's a lot of, you know, jealousy and fighting and, and questioning about whether they're selling out and all this stuff. So I don't know if their, if their quest to find the thing that they were doing was driven by the, the, the desire to get a gallery. Um, I, I, I think it was more just the, that was the way artists thought then is that they had to come up with their thing. Um, and it was the, it was definitely the men who were thinking that way. And I think the, you know, I, my, my take is that the women were much more, um, um, willing to be attentive to what was going on and, and wanted to connect deeper. And then that process of connecting deeper has allowed deeper things in and, and those deeper things go beyond just the personal, they become universal. That's my, my thought anyway. So, you know, whether they, you know, I, I went and sat, I was at the Whitney a week or so ago and in the room where the Pollock is, there's a Pollock and a de Kooning and a, a, um, the de Kooning's door to the river and there's a Joan Mitchell painting, this one. And I sat there and, and I, you know, I have to say, I found this more interesting than the Pollock. Like the Pollock was energetic and, and it was a successful Pollock, but it, doesn't have anything else in there. There's nothing else coming in from the real world, nothing coming in, no other sense of some mystery that I don't understand. Whereas there were lots of things about this that I didn't understand. So, you know, I don't know. Like, I think it's, if, if the so thing- are, are you saying that this is the, the, the connection with the real world that, that makes a difference? That, that the, yeah. the way, the way, the way- I'm saying yeah, it- it's the paying attention to what's evolving uh, in the relationships of the paint and um, reading that and letting those forming relationships and the way that they add up to something bigger direct you in terms of what, how you're going to proceed for that, that painting. I agree with you that it's a more interesting painting. 
But I think when it comes down to galleries, I think what sells is what people tend to do again and again, because their galleries want to sell. Yeah, I'm not sure that's relevant though. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I'm not sure it's relevant, not just because, you know, like the things that are going to sell are going to be blue paintings of landscapes with cows in them. You know, if you really want to think about what's going to sell, that's what's that's going to sell. That's only partly true. I mean, that's a certain audience, but there's another audience too. Yeah. That's not fair. Well, no, the, it, it, the, you know, the most successful landscape of all time is that, that American guy who's got the, shop, the shops in all the malls and he's worth oh, yeah. you know, millions, you know? I used to print some of that stuff. I mean, yeah, yeah it's, it sells, but it doesn't sell to the same, same you know, people that would be interested in, in, in the work that you're looking at now. Well, these sell very well. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's you know, why a you know a beautiful, subtle landscape, even if that sells well, it it you know so does this. Yeah. Depending think, on how much money you have. What's that? It also depends upon how much money you have, whether you can buy one or the other. Yeah. Well, these I think the these have a lot more randomness in them. They're not as predictable. Um, so I think that's what makes them interesting is that they're not, um, you know, where you dust your hands off and you're done. Yeah. You know, it's, it's much more, ra they're more random. They ramble, they ramble on sort of. They yeah. keep you thinking, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I agree. So the, it, the, in, in the, the author made the point that Mitchell connects herself to her art through painterly segments. So little sections, the way two marks fit together or three or four or five start, then she- Peter. Yeah. I like the painting because it's much colorful. You think this is, is colorful? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. What about this one? What about this one, Shani? It's called Hemlock. More colorful, it's beautiful, and and it's more um colors inside. Yeah. So Mitchell said that she basically thinks of something. And then that leads her to feel something. And that's when she make that's when she makes her painting. So she begins by thinking of something and then that leads her to, to feel something. So it's a slightly different way of approaching it than Krasner. Like Krasner's beginning with drawing all over sort of drawing. And then as she draws all over that suggests something and she starts to realize those what's suggested and turning those shapes into actual forms. And you can sort of see her doing it all the way through her career in different ways. But as she's turning them into form, she's evoking something, sense of light, sense of volume, sense of movement. Whereas Mitchell's very different. This is called Ladybug. So not unrelated, are they? This one to this one to this one. In terms of the sort of organization. Done around the same time. This is done in 57, 56. 57. So, so to play devil's advocate, wouldn't you look at those four paintings and go, oh, that, that, that's, a, that's another Mitchell painting? Yeah, it's it. Well, no. Which one series, right? 
these were done so these are all done like within a year you know so i you know i think there's an evolution occurring that we're sort of looking at and you know these are the images i've, I've just picked out or actually that the author sort of referred to so i haven't even really been that selective but but the you know this is very different and it's done in 58 so quite a lot more evocative of landscape no Yeah, so what's evoked in each of them is is definitely different, different mood, even if the technique of the marks is somewhat similar. Yeah. I feel like part of the experience of looking at these paintings too is that the process of the arriving at this image is not hidden in the painting, if that makes sense. Like, I feel like I can... Like you're talking about how um, paying close attention to the relationship of the paints and what they're doing. I feel like I'm not, like I'm, I'm also, as much as I'm enjoying seeing the final image, I'm also getting kind of a peek behind the veil of the process that led to it uh, on the painting itself too. Yeah, and maybe that process, like, like these all have that sort of roughness to them, right? Like, this is pretty clean this is pretty clean even though it's it, you know there's lots of splashy paint but you get us you get a different sense from you know these ones than you then well i do anyway than than these ones you know like there's a lot of there's a lot of fumbling in the dark going on in these ones i think to get there you know which to me is like, the, oh, sorry, Olivier. So I was going to say in the, in the male ones, right? The, the first ones, the, the, the Kuning, uh, the Pollock, what, 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 takes all, what takes a lot of space is the ego. I mean, you, get, you get a sense of uh, a strong personality, right? And, and uh, this is a very, again, very macho and everything, which is very different in, in, the, in the, the women painting, I find. Yeah. And it's not that the women painting, they're just, they just, they're very various, they're very diverse, they're maybe more diverse because they, they're directly reacting to the world. So they have access to infinite, infinite experience. And they're not into, I don't know, expressing the, just a strong ego, which is, you know, it, it's, it's very strong and it's very, and, and you know, you, you admire that, but, but it's, uh, it's, very, it's a very different exercise. Yeah. And that's the way I react to that. Yeah. Thanks, Olivia. Yeah, I, I get the sense that, like, I think you're right, Rudy, in terms of the drawing in here what we end up with seems as though it's explained or we can interpret from what's underneath as to how these marks were arrived at. And it's, it's you know, they, they were almost just arrived at too. They weren't f flashily arrived at. It wasn't sort of, as Olivia was saying, the imposition of ego. It, it's like not, not like a, a fixed known thing. It's an unknown thing that was found. Very intuitive. Here's another one. This is from 56. So those were all um, that the author chose 57, 56, around that time. This is Frankenthaler, you know this one? Mountain and Sea, sort of the the her her famous painting, the first one that she made with on the um unprimed canvas. Oh. Fifty-two. There it is there. But she even titles it, so you know, letting us know that yeah, she is thinking of that as sea and this is mountains. Who's seen this painting? No one's seen this painting? Just in a book. <laughs> yeah. 
I did see a, a, a big exhibit of hers though in Provincetown. Um, some of her really large paintings, um, stained paintings were there, it was beautiful. Yeah. So she talks about distilling feelings into her into her work. Talks about letting in references to landscape, like like almost just um, allowing in things from the landscape. But she talks about risk and magic, like equates the two. I, is what this is the sense I got from that essay. That's called Jacob's Ladder. Mm. Where, where did you find the essay? I, since I didn't see it, I don't have any reference. Yeah, I think um, Katya sent it to us all, the PDF. Um, uh, uh, Olivia sent us the PDF. It's from the Women in Abstract Expressionist catalog. Uh -huh. It was a show that was in Denver a few years back. And um, a big show, and it has you know, all the main protagonists in the in the catalogue and then in the back of the catalogue, it sort of has a page on the ones on, you know, even the ones that don't get shown where there was no room to put them in the show. Um, it has, it'll have a page on different individuals. So it's, it's a pretty extensive catalogue. Okay. And the best day was in it. So we sort of got talking about it. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm sorry if you didn't get if you didn't get it. Although I thought I thought it was emailed to everyone, so yeah, somehow I missed it. It, it could have been, but I I must have missed it, obviously. Yeah, I missed it too. Your, yeah. um, Thank you, though. Your system may have overruled it and put it into junk, but it was uh, sent along with uh, with a recording. I don't remember on what day. A couple of weeks ago, right? Yeah, yeah it was. Like, it was like the February fourth one. It was an attachment. Oh, okay. Uh, I think I put it uh, in the subject, so. Okay, darn, I missed it. Oh. This is another. Uh, Peter, you, 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 those are, you said they're on prime canvas? Yeah. And so what what does it do? I mean, it, 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 it everything is more fainted or what's the. If you, yeah, if you paint on on prime canvas, it sinks in. Yeah. So it's like when you just sell a canvas, the, the you, you gesso it with sort of um you make your gesso a little bit watery if you're using acrylic gesso say and it'll sink in a little bit it'll soak into the fibers if you're oil priming then you sort of you 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 um you put the rabbit skin glue on and it sinks into the fibers basically and then you put the and it basically forms a barrier that you then put the oil primer on top. Right, right. And then that oil primer then takes it, it'll 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 pr provide a chemical bond and a mechanical bond with the oil paint. So so the oil paint won't sink into the actual linen or the actual you know your your canvas. If you paint onto directly onto the canvas, it sinks in and it'll be it it goes a bit like a watercolor. It'll run exactly. So she she's she's using oil as watercolor kind of by doing that right. I mean yeah. a little bit. It won't run as much as it would if, if you're painting on the paper or so, but because it's a fabric, mm -hmm. but it'll still run. And you know, and it she was very that. remarkable at the time. It looked like nobody else's paintings. Her paintings were always recognizable because of this runniness, right? Water, watery look. I loved it. You, uh, you did, Sarah? I loved it. I thought it was really pretty. <laughs> yeah. How are, how are they holding up? Because somebody once told me that if you didn't prime the canvas that they, they wouldn't hold up as long. How how are hers historically holding up? Do you know? I saw this at the Museum of Modern Art today, Sue. And it and it looks really, really good? Well, it's, the, you know, it's the Museum of Modern Art's job to make it hold up. Hmm. You know, they own it and it's relevant so they're going to make sure it survives now so is there anything special than they that they have to do to make sure it does 
Possibly. Okay. But you know, artists with you know who are ambitious are always doing things that they probably shouldn't do. Right. True. True. So. Da Vinci, when he painted his Last Supper, twelve months later, after after it was finished, it it needed to be um, completely reconditioned, completely repaired, because he was trying to make it better. You know, trying to do more with the materials than the materials could do. Mere fresco, because fresco is just watercolor, basically. Yeah. So it's just you're putting pigment onto a wet surface that then dries. So you basically can only paint while it's drying. Well, it's wet, sorry. So, you know, you do one little shape at a time and you have all these um, craftsmen there who prepare the wall for you and then they, they, you know, trail up this beautiful clean surface. And then you've got the cartoon for that shape and you, someone dusts it off and then you paint it in. So there's no room that you have with oil painting to basically spend some time with thing to really make the form magical. Right. And Da Vinci wanted that. <laughs> So he started playing with the materials of the frescoes, but of course that ruined the surface. The whole point of the fresco is that the pigment gets, there's a chemical reaction and it goes into the surface of the wall. So it's permanent. But as soon as you play with that, then it's, then you get all sorts of trouble. So that's what, you know, Da Vinci played with that and, and you know, it didn't last at all. It hasn't lasted at all. It didn't even last 12 months. Well. Wow. So, you know, I wouldn't worry about it. So if you do something great, someone's going to work out how to take care of it. And, you know, so just I'll that's, keep that in don't, mind. don't worry about them. Don't worry about the, the archival qualities. You know, gallery, you know, no one's going to care really if it's awesome. <laughs> like how many times have I seen de Kooning's oil paintings on newspaper now that get shown. Jesus. There's nothing archival about that. <laughs> Yet somehow they're, you know, they're, someone's got done a PhD on how to make those things not fall apart, obviously. I'm going to work on my oatmeal tomorrow morning to see what I come up with. <laughs> yeah. So these are the last couple of Frankenthalers I wanted to show. I put an extra Frankenthaler in because she, she shifted quite a lot got really interesting I thought very evocative right of of but of things in the real world not specific in terms of a scene or something but she's letting light in and she's letting air in and I thought we'd finish with this one so different that's Frankenthaler yeah, this was done in 2000. Wow. Wow. I it wouldn't have guessed right? that. So nice. I've more of a range of, I've never, I've never really understood Frank, Frankenthaler before, so I've really enjoyed getting into her a bit, but. This is beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's it's wow. Was that unprimed as well, Peter? I think so. Although I don't know, but I mm. think, I don't think she would have changed her way of working late in life and suddenly started priming her canvas. I guess it's quite layered, so maybe the underneath is more kind of like yeah. watery. It's all grey fireworks from 2000, so you can look it up, um, Bonnie, and see what you up on Google. Grey fireworks, 2000, Helen Frankenthal, and you'll find, you know, more information about the painting. She's being tricky with that title, you know. She's being tricky? Well, you know, with the title, Grey Fire will come in, so contradictory. Nice. Yeah. So Frankenthalers all are, have allusions to landscape right from the beginning. I look at them all and it never really goes away. Mm. True. And you know that that's um so anyway, that's where we're gonna stop tonight because I wanna there's some people